it's about this. We create community, use challenge as the catalyst. The trust breeds magic. We're gonna connect on the same level. Possibility is bigger than they imagine. Like any experiment, the reason you do it is to learn. Who would you be without opportunity? The learnings of this experiment are gonna be on the edge of what's possible. Everybody! I can do this and it's worth doing. This became a love for us in this place. My name is Eduardo Garcia. I live in Emigrant, Montana, Big Sky Country, just outside of Bozeman. Big Sky Country has been my playground since I was a little kid. At 18, I spent two really busy years going to cooking school in Seattle, and one day I got a phone call, and it was an offer I could not refuse. At 20, I was a classically trained chef cooking on these multi-million dollar luxury yachts. Every chance I got, I jumped ship, I headed out, and I explored the country, the people, the places, and the culture, always through its food. I remember rolling into this market in Mexico as a classically trained chef, menu in hand, and realizing that I was going to have to be a chef that explored searched and created new ways to cook wherever I was at. Oh, nice one. That's dinner, man. I'll eat it. There we go. <laughs> I didn't sleep much then. I was always moving. I was always trying, cooking, eating, climbing, surfing. I was always out. This was something I wanted to share with others, something I was going to share. Yeah, man, that is going to be good. This is what it's all about. It's coming out here, hanging with good buddies, being active and enjoying really great food. Yeah, perfect. But sometimes, you get a curveball. I walked away from the boats and came back to Montana. I had a pretty big injury last fall. I was out on a typical day bow hunting for elk. Was probably two miles in and came across something that caught my eye in a drainage. It looked like a small bear skull. Kneeled and lights out, black. The next memory I have from getting to my knees was the sound of gravel, feet shuffling on, on a road, on a dirt road. Oh my God, I got electrocuted. This thought in my brain was, you're getting help. Don't stop walking. Don't stop walking. Don't stop walking. Uh, I was airlifted down to Salt Lake City, Utah, to the burn trauma center there, and I spent 47 days in burn trauma ICU. Being alive with few handicaps is much better than being dead. That's for sure. That's for damn sure. Since I've been back in Montana, it's definitely been an exploration. What works, what doesn't work, it takes a lot longer to tie my shoes, but there are very few things I've found that I can't do thus far. There's definitely challenges, but you get it. It's okay to screw up, it's okay to not get it right, it's okay to not be as efficient as you were, you'll get it, you'll get it, you'll get it. Persistence definitely pays off. They have gotten back into cooking, and um, you know what? It's cooking. I mean, it's in here, it's up here, it's waking up and saying, okay, if I'm going to grab something, how do I do it? And then, and then going, and then doing it. Ooh, feels really good to be in the kitchen again, that's for sure. You may not be able to grab it like you used to, but I guarantee you can do it. Oh, shit. I probably said I can't take holding a 70-pound cooler. I can't approach life differently after this. I, I can't change who the DNA of who I am. It's just how you do it. Hot pan, right behind Jeff. We have a Mexican foods company here in Montana. I do private chefing still. 
time is precious and valuable and you should be doing something productive with it. It is bird hunting season. I have this dish in mind of doing pheasant. Most of the ingredients I need for this dish, I can get right here if I know where to look and know where to find them. Montana prepared me well. Alabama, Arkansas, I love my mom there's hunting season, there's foraging seasons, there's putting it away and bringing it out of the pantry seasons. Basically, I had this knowledge of yachting, working with high-end ingredients in high-end kitchen, but my inside passion was still, how can I take what I know outside instead of just caveman, Neanderthal cooking over fire, but really take my culinary education into my outdoor education and put the two together into a really great dish. We just scored this beautiful ringneck pheasant down here. Breasts on this meat, it's gonna be so juicy. The idea struck that, you know, I would love to share this with people and, and teach a little bit and learn how other people are doing it in other cultures. The rose hips. A lot of people may walk by bushes like this and think, oh, that'll kill me, that'll kill me, that'll kill me. But when you know it and you look around, there is so much edible food out here, even in the middle of winter. Yep. Traveling is food-based. I mean, first and foremost, I will eat 10 meals a day because there's a limited amount of time to taste the culture here and soak it in. And food is the pathway into that country. That is really good. A little bitter, a little sharp, still a little buttery. This is a really good patch of crust and go great in our meal for sure. Some nights I stay up cashing in my bad luck. In moving forward, I feel a sense of urgency to milk the pulp out of life. You better get every single drop out of what you got. I had this inner drive and desire to connect with people and say, hey, we're on the same level. Who are you? This is me. Let's share. Let's connect. Let's have a meal. <laughs> I think more people need to know how to do this and this and eat together. Me moving forward in life is not about having 10 fingers and 10 toes. It's about who I am inside, what my inner drive and passion is to get out and do. I think I lost a year of my life. Now I'm playing catch up. over the last couple days here. And um, I told Carolyn, who picked us up in San Fran, that we gotta start this earlier. You know, and I know a lot of us can't take days and days and days to come hang out in a gorgeous place. Um, but we gotta get homework next time so that we're doing things that get us here while we're still wrapping things up. So by day one, we're already feeling like day three. Um, Thank you for those of you that have already seen that, watching it again, and those that didn't, thank you for watching it. Um, there's been this totally edible energy the last couple of days about doing rightfully so, and uh, about sharing and communicating and harnessing that inner bit in all of us to say, I got this and I can do this, and it's worth doing. And I want to speak a little bit about that, but I want to take it from another angle that I have some experience in, and that's how you continue to do that when all the cards are against you, and when you're a bag of bones with a heartbeat, and when you're coming from the bottom. And some of you will relate to that, 
and I hope not a lot of you relate to it because I don't ever want anyone to be there. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak from that. And um, I'll probably I'll, I'll roll through the slideshow. It'll just help me narrate through sort of a little bit of my background and a little bit of um, what goes on up here. Um, you know, Matt sent me an email, and I'm horrible at email, so if you want to get a hold of me, call five times. When the fifth time I know it's important, I'll call you back. <laughs> um, I used to be a good typist. I actually went to military school um, in Roswell, New Mexico in 96, and typing, I was like, ace that class. And um, I actually lament a little bit that um, I'm just not as good anymore with the hook. Uh, I can kick some ass at a lot of things, but typing, and I feel, oh, that's okay, that's a loss I can handle. <laughs> but email, uh, Jen, my partner, uh, is amazing. She, uh, she's really good at typing. <laughs> Oftentimes, like, hey, Jen, can you bust this email? No problem. Um, but I got this email from Matt, and um, hey, Eduardo, we saw your reel uh, online, and we'd love to have you down to do lectures. What the heck is a do lectures? I took a quick look, and there's more going on in my life than I should have going. Um, you know, I, uh, God, I just want to do everything, and, and I, I think I end up diluting myself, as I heard earlier. So, so I, I do pull back, and Jen reels me back all the time. And, um, but I said yes. I said, I, gotta, I got to do that. We have to be there. And um, so I started thinking, and, and it really, I want to thank the Do Lectures for having me here. And being the last guy up is a big deal. Um, I've been rubbing lavender all over my face all day because it's supposed to, it's everywhere and it smells great, but it's supposed to chill you out. <laughs> and it smells good. Um, it's a big deal to be up here, you know? I mean, you guys put in quality time, and time is our most valuable asset. And, um, you know, so, so wrapping this up, I, I kind of have to tear it down first, because as a chef, we always do that. We always open the walk-in and kind of, what do we got here? What are we working with? We can't just say OK. And um, so that email, Matt, I, I kind of looked at Jen, and she said, what are you going to talk about? I was like, I don't know. I don't know what he wants me to talk about. And I even called Matt. I was like, so Matt, what am I supposed to talk about? <laughs> you know? And uh, he's like, just talk about you. Bring you. Be yourself. Talk about whatever you want. And I actually found it really helpful that some of the other speakers will know that do Lecture sends out these like reminder emails. So when I did get them weeks after they came in, um, it was kind of cool because it came up with this do's and don'ts, which was helpful. Um, I, I, I'm a no bullshit kind of guy. I like to cut to the chase. Um, so when I see a list like that, it's always like, what do you want me to do? We can, we can discuss this over wine later, but right now in the heat of the moment, what do we got to do? What do we got to do? And so with that list, it said, don't, re don't write anything. <laughs> Don't read out of anything. Don't, you know, don't pre-prepare anything. And just bring you. And so I said, OK, I do that a lot. And I learned that lesson as a chef years ago. Um, don't ever make a menu ahead of time unless you know what you're getting into. And then, then you can do it. Because um, on my first yacht, I rolled in a Puerto Vallarta, and I spent a week just letting myself go into this menu. And it was going to be amazing. And then I roll up to the Mexi grocer or whatever it was. And, they don't have black cod, and they don't have sake lees. You know, I had this black cod katsuzuke dish plan, and Nobu did it, I'm going to do it. It's going to be amazing. And you can get zucchinis, and cebolla, and tomate, and jalapeno, and cilantro, and the things that you should get in Mexico, not the things I wanted to make in Mexico. So that's the last time I put myself into a huge thing like that. So I said, OK, well, regardless of whether I can pre-prepare something, I, I need to at least get some juices flowing in. So I started thinking about it, and I started asking myself, and a few things today, I know it's, it's 25 minutes is not a lot of time, so I'm, I'm going to button it in, but some of these photos I've never shared before, other than with Jen and my mom and some close friends, my brother, and, but I'm happy to share them with you guys, and I'm totally thrilled to speak about myself, which it's taken a long time, not just this injury, but prior to be comfortable with me and with talking about me, because it's kind of uncomfortable talking about yourself sometimes. <laughs> But I'm okay with that, and so I look forward to that. And there is kind of some, some of them are a little eye-opening in regards to this, so just be prepared. And, but then I, I started asking, like, okay, Eduardo, what are you going to speak about? Wow. What do you know? <laughs> well, I know food. I know food really well. 
And I was like, but I don't want to talk food with these guys. Like, we can talk food over dinner and lunch and breakfast. And we've been doing that. You know, I've been just shoveling it in. Um, but I, I don't think that's what I'm supposed to talk about, is food. Um, what else do I know really well? Just thinking, like, wow, well, I like hunting. <laughs> I like the outdoors. I don't like it well enough to be an authority. You know, like, hearing some of you guys talk ahead of me, you guys were authorities on what you were talking about. Like, you had it. And I thought, man. So I've been developing this over the last few days, and you all have been a part of what I'm saying today because you've helped me get up here and talk. And I thought, OK, I need to talk about me. I just need to bring me. I need to talk about me because that's what I know best. OK, this is good. I'll talk about me. So I'll start just with this first photo. Um, this first photo is in the Grenadines, and you know, coming as a as a punk kid that got kicked out of every school I ever went to, um, except for the last one where I graduated with a high school diploma, and um, you know, I was told you're never going to be anything. You are going to be a gas attendant, which, I mean, come on, we need gas attendants, or we used to before, you know, self-service places. But I got, all, I got it all to me, and, and rightfully so, because I was a punk. Um, I was. I was in and out of juvie. I was in and out of probation. I was just, I was going after it wrong. But I meant well, you know, like I did. I meant well. And I realized I just, I was taking the wrong approach, you know? Like, I just, I just had more energy than, than I was a accurately using. And you know, I spent a whole year with my desk in the hallway because I was too disruptive in class. So I took that whole class, it was like my fourth grade year, in the hallway listening. You know, like, you know, I, 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 I had a pretty good like, GPA when I finally graduated high school. So I don't feel it was a loss, but I remember it. And no angst or anything like that. I just, hmm, that's not how it's supposed to be. So something was off there. And you know, my mom thankfully kept, um, kept them at bay when they wanted to give me Ritalin. And I'm a twin, so there were two of us. And, and yet, unfortunately for my brother, Eugenio, we call Huge, um, I was the troublemaker. And he just had to like, go with me every time I forced us to leave a school. And, um, but I think I, I, think I realized um, when I was 17, and I decided I'm going to clean up my act, and I'm going to focus on self. And you know, David talked about ego yesterday, and um, before that, you know, there was a mention of, of of we being greater than I, and I actually I want to draw on that a little bit because I, I actually feel that ego is positive, and I feel like we is made up of I, like we is I, we is us, we is this, and and it is about this, but this is us, it's I. And, and so I had to stop and say, okay, I need to focus on me. What am I doing wrong here? And so I realized through cooking, really, that I needed to keep my hands busy. I needed to be productive. And I needed to give because that energy I had needed to go somewhere. I needed an outlet. It was just going to get me into trouble. So I started cooking at 15, and I loved it. Everyone was at the rainbow gatherings, getting bamboozled in the woods, and I was cooking, and I was loving it. And those were the first challenges, you know? Those were the first challenges where they were huge, and you didn't know how to overcome them. And you just say, okay, the tickets are just printing out like this on the floor, and you and your buddy Micah are looking at each other, and you're like, we got this, one by one. And that's kind of like life today, you know, one by one, you just tackle them. And so that kind of segues into high school and cooking school. And I said to myself that when I graduated, I'm so thankful I did, Eduardo, if you don't go directly to cooking school, like immediately, you will disappear, my friend, into the world of recreational pastime. Like <laughs> surfing, climbing, loving, gone. And I did. I went to culinary school in Seattle, Washington. And I didn't do any of my homework. Typical Eduardo fashion, but I, I crushed it with just myself every day. I, I worked three full time jobs and I had school full time. I barely slept and um, I was so happy. 
I was doing things and I was learning things and I was, uh, it was such an incredible time to be productive. And there I am, my last month, and a yacht pulls into town and they just fired their chef for chugging mouthwash and they needed a chef immediately. And um, teacher Robert Wood comes up to me and I'm making chocolate ganache for my internship and I'm by myself because the kitchen was vacant and Chef Robert Wood, Eduardo, I got a job that you cannot pass up. What is this? I'm stoked because all I know is I'm graduating and I'm interning at a Japanese restaurant, but I don't know what I'm doing after that and a lot of bills are coming. And uh, he tells me it's a yacht, you gotta go get an interview. So I got the interview and then I turned the job down. I turned the job down because I, I felt I wasn't quite ready to take it yet. And that's another important lesson I've learned is timing. Timing is crucial. And however, when the phone rang in October, six months later, and it woke me up, <clears throat> hello, and it was Captain Mark Trullo at Encinitas. Hey, Eduardo, Captain Mark Trullo, um, remember us on the Dorothea? Hey, we're hiring again, and you're on top of our list. You got a week, let us know. And I jumped, I jumped right in, like we've heard this week, and I jumped right in, I took that job, and I wasn't a chef, I was a line cook, and I was a good line cook. Um, but I was like, I'm doing that. I can't pass this up again. And that started this 11 year journey into, gosh, yeah, amazing dream job. I, I gotta tell you, and I say that humbly, but it was an amazing dream job, cooking for royalty, cooking for billionaires, trying to get kidnapped to go cook at the Princess of Bahrain's house, um, literally. And, and then also just cooking for friends and family and, and people like us who are just as valuable. And it really taught me this leveling playing field that we, it doesn't matter who we are, you should, you know, it taught me this lesson that you gotta respect everyone from where they come from because I knew that I'm still inside. I'm just that scrappy punk from Montana and yet I'm on like a million dollar yacht in the middle of Monte Carlo with passes to everywhere. And, Wow, how did I end up here? And it really, that was a short lesson that just taught me, you know what, we are all worth it, and we are all valuable, and we all have the ability to get there. And um, this is just one of those photos that, you know, I'm not in yachting anymore, but this reminds me of that, so I wanted to include that. That's Eduardo. Um, the blind date, the port of Nice, Michelle Flynn was a stewardess from Canada. Great gal, a lot of fun. She was my actually partner in arms for many years because she was one of the only other crew members that didn't want to get lashed every night and she just wanted to go explore like me, so we would. Um, I, had a, I had a kind of a rhythm that whenever it was a birthday, guest or crew, it was all the same to me. And you got to pick breakfast, lunch, and dinner and your dessert. And sometimes that wasn't great because some people wanted kind of random things and not the other 11 of the crew didn't, but she wanted, a, uh, she wanted this breakfast her granny made, which was fresh rolls with a fried egg and cheddar cheese. That's what she got. So that's that photo. <laughs> this photo is also me with uh, Pete. Pete, and Pete is a very Afrikaans, South African, huge fellow, and this is crossing the Atlantic on one of four crossings I did. This was on a sailboat um, called Ocean Phoenix. It was a 77-foot boat, and um, oh man, what an incredible journey that was in, in just the power of the wind and another great life lesson, which all of this is, um, and that was control, that you know what? I'm not in control of you guys. You're not in control of me. We're in control of us, and that's pretty much it. Like you can only control this, your heart, your mind, your insides, and you can try to control your emotions, but good luck. And, um, and that, uh, that was a great lesson on that trip. And again, I've included this just, just to show, again, this, this lifestyle that I was having. It was fun, it was young, uh, it seemed like there was no rules. I mean, this was seven of us crossing the Atlantic for 30 days, it, anything went. You know, as long as there was breakfast, lunch, and dinner for these guys, Everything went. Um, <laughs> that, the, the apron I did rock out all the time, actually. This is the midpoint of the Atlantic, back when I used to shoot a, a film camera. And um, the textures in that I love, and I, I go back to the light a lot because 
it was one of those humbling, those moments that reminds all of us, and I know you've all had them, where you just remind yourself about the beauty that exists everywhere. And I do that a lot. Um, I do it a lot. And this moment, you know, huge, wide open, huge. Scary huge, swallow you up, drown, huge. But at the same time, beautiful and quiet and just blank canvas, you know. Um, you could be who you wanted to be in the middle of the ocean. No one was going to say anything to you. And this is on the front of the bow of the yacht as we're cruising. Um, kind of just another building block for, for myself of just check where I'm at. I guess I made some good decisions in life. And um, I made those by going with my heart. So that's important. <laughs> you know, um, Brad was talking about uh, yesterday about being voted the, uh, where is he? Being voted the, there you are, the most eligible bachelor by Cosmo, right? And, and you heard it so many times that you had to finally just be like, all right, I guess I am. I'll be okay with this. And, um, you know, I thought to Jen, I was like, should I put this up there? I'm half naked. And Jen was like, well, you do what you want. And I said, okay, I'll put it up there. Because this is an important photo. This photo is about you can do anything. You can do anything you want. You just have to do it. And you got to step into it. you got to step into your life. You can't just sit on the sides. you got to be there. And this was in the Tobago Keys. And we had uh, one of the most demanding charters we ever did. We had um, Russian guests on board. Not a lot of them, there was like seven, and there was 11 crews, so we could handle this, and yet it was, oh my gosh, the amount of food they ate. I didn't sleep, I mean, it was average on a charter for me to get about, you know, four hours of sleep a night, and this was a 10-day charter. We started in St. Martin, we dropped them off in the Grenadines. We would move every day, and um, this was our second to last night, and um, Jen will remember this, she was in the UK at the time, and the, principal charterer, the guy that rented the boat, comes in and he's in some kind of banana hammock thing and I'm cooking away and I'm like rocking out crew meal. So it must have been, if I was prepping crew meal, it would have been three o'clock in the afternoon. I cleaned up lunch, doing crew meal. Eduardo, ceviche was great today. Hey, thank you. Um, so in Russia, tomorrow is Christmas. I'm thinking, cool, nice, Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, I'm still working. He can't stop working. And he's like, so, I want to celebrate here. You know how to do Orthodox Christmas dinner? Yeah, I know how to do Orthodox Christmas dinner. Um, what time? Mm, six o'clock. Okay. And, and, and insides, I'm just thinking, okay, now leave. I got to get going on this. And um, he did. And that was my go-to phrase, no matter what, no matter what. Never say no. Say no problem, or let me see what I can do, or sure. And you don't have to lie to someone and set them up, and you don't want to set yourself up for failure. And honestly, I feel if you try your best, you haven't failed. You just may have not met exactly where you wanted to be. And so immediately, I hit Jen up on MSN, because for so many years, and yet she still sits by my side, we had a Skype MSN relationship. Jen. What the hell is an Orthodox Christmas dinner? I need to know ASAP, send me some examples. And then I get back to crew dinner. Check it 30 minutes later. Oh shit, it's a 15 course meal. <laughs> and it, it's random things. It's like a bulgur wheat pudding with raisins and it's, um, it's just this stuff. And I'm thinking, I have I'm, I'm Russian descent. My mom's Jewish. And, but I wasn't raised Jewish. I was raised in like a, a, cult, a commune in Montana, so I didn't get any of this stuff. And whatever, I set myself into it. And uh, on top of that, he comes in. So the dinner goes. That, that's not the point. The dinner goes, and it, it's great. And um, then he comes in at dinner, and he's smashed on vodka. Eduardo, our friends are in the band next to us, and they want to barbecue tomorrow. Okay, cool. Yes, and they have a fish. And their chef doesn't know how to cook fish. OK, great. I'm thinking, what do you want me to do? And he's like, can you go get the fish? It's like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll get the fish. I took a little boat with the deckhand and cruise over to Aphrodite, was the name of the yacht. Gorgeous sailing boat. And it's not that the first chef didn't know how to cook fish, but he told the captain he didn't have time to deal with the fish. 
So no problem, man. And we made a quick powwow, like, all right, you handle salads and sides and lamb chops, and I'll do, and no, ribs, I'll do lamb chops, snapper, and dessert. So I grab this huge snapper, get back, and it's like midnight, and I'm thinking, okay. And I know in the yachting industry, this is what I always knew, and this is why I never got any sleep, is that if I woke up past 5 a.m., I was setting myself up for failure. And the fear of failure is far greater than the need of sleep, for me anyway. And so I said, okay. And I put some music on, probably something soft and mellow, because that's what gets me going. And um, (laughs) true story. Anyone, anyone who saw me earlier, I'm a little dusty. I was like playing with flour. I don't know why I was in the kitchen, but um, I had just like instrumental on. I'm like, oh, nice music, Eduardo. Thank you. And um, so yeah, so I, I started kicking some ass because that's what you got to do when you're up against the wall, don't you? You got, you got to do it. You got to like give it everything because if you don't give it everything, you will fail. And failure is not an option. You got to do it. And so, sure, I scaled that fish and I got it. This is the transom. And I took this photo. I took a lot of self-portraits back back then. I still do. Um, because it was memorable to me that I was doing it. And I had to remind myself. And this is about building your ego for the right reasons. This is about remembering those moments when you're doing it right. And you're doing it well. And you're proud of yourself. So that when you back up against a wall, you dig into your bank and you say, you know what? I did this before and I kicked some ass. But be- hold on. 1 plus 2 equals 3. This is how I kicked ass. i got to believe in myself. And so that's why I took this photo. And that's why I wanted to show it with everyone. Because this was at like 1.30. Ran in. My dad's from the Yucatan, Mexico. He was raised in the jungle. And there's a great marinade for snapper tikin chic, which is mine. And it's achiote paste and lime juice and dry oregano and salt and pepper. And it's wrapped in banana leaves. And so that's what I did with that snapper. And then I made dessert. It was a mango and lime mousse. And I threw it in little Dixie cups. And I made, let's see, it was about 25 people. And I think I got... No sleep that night. But it didn't matter. It went, went off like a charm. It was great. And, you know, uh, that photo, that's me sitting there going, like, I got this. And that's because I believed in myself. If I had told myself, I had bitched and moaned, if I had said, I don't got this, or like, oh my God, that chef can't do the snapper, come on, buddy, do the snapper. It's your snapper, it's in your fridge. I, well, that's a waste of time. You know, it was a waste of time. And so the, this is the Port of Nice again. And this is a little bit of the Montana boy in me coming out. This is living in that world, which was so foreign to my friends and so foreign to my family. But that world um, of, of a high, that crazy super yacht world. And yet, I still wanted to do it by my terms. And so I would, I would take my longboard and I would cruise through the downtown streets to my favorite uh, boulangerie and pick up some baguettes and cruise back. And I probably took like 20 photos till I finally caught myself in frame on one of those self-portraits. <laughs> you know, I, I love skating still. And, and anyway, I'm glad I took that shot. And I just, this was, this was the beginning of me slowing down and yachting after 11 years and I could pick my job. You know, I could literally just call, call a friend, and I, but I didn't. I mean, I'd been to this last boat called the Blind Date for eight years, and that was the last yacht I was on. But I'd reached that point and where, where you've done so well because you've done it that um, I could go to any boat and, and say, hey, when you get an opening, give me a buzz. I'd love to work on this yacht. So it was a great point in, in yachting. Um, I was widely known, and humbly, but widely known in the yachting community as being one of the, the better chefs or in the industry at the time. And it wasn't just um, because my food was great, because I, I smoked a lot as a kid, and my palate just got nailed. And, um, but it, it was that attitude, you know? So, so even if you're not a chef, it's the attitude that affected the food. Um, and, and it was also, one more note I'd like to make is, it was, it was the food, but it was, it was that part of me that said, I don't care where I'm from, and I don't care where you're from, but we're going to connect like this. We're going to connect on the same level. And I'll respect you, and I'm going to praise you for your successes and for how you got here. But I, w- I want you to know this is me. And how are you ever going to say, wow, Eduardo, like, great story. Or, you know, 
or, or way to go, or you know, you're an interesting guy. And how are they gonna know the me that I really am unless I bring me to the table when I meet them for the first time? And so many people in yachting, I would encourage them to just, hey guys, when people come, it's not about service, it's not about clean linens, it's not about the food, and it's not about jet skis being clean and full and, and chamoised and, and free of spots. That's a prerequisite, that's just gotta happen, we gotta be on it. But they're coming for us, they're coming to experience. And if we bring ourselves to the table, that experience, you can't print that on a brochure, we will become greater than, than any ad any charter magazine could tell about us. So when they walk on board, be respectful, give them their space, feel them out, but be yourself and, and do it big time. And, you know, I think a lot of them got it. I think some kind of looked at me like, God, you're so full of yourself, Ed. And, and unfortunately, but a lot of them did get that message. So I share that too here. I'm gonna make sure I'm not going out of order. Huh, okay, good. Um, so at that peak of yachting, you know, at that place where I had a great career that I kind of just fell into, and um, I knew a few things were off. Um, also, like Brett, you know, like he was having fun, he was kayaking, he had everything going, and then something was off, he needed more. He was like unfulfilled while being filled. And, you know, Jen, instrumental in pushing the bill in me always and um, she once said to me like what are you doing man like you got this great job you make good money and yet like you're not doing anything about it and as a family of food lovers we all, food is essential to us and we had been making salsa from scratch for a long time and friends had started to encourage us to do something about it and Jen was an essential part in um, saying all right I'm tired of hearing you guys talk about it and so me and, and my brother and Jen's brother and Jen and my older sister, this isn't all of us, started a company called Montana Max. We started it from scratch. We started it on, on my dime and everyone else's sweat equity and everyone else's creativity. And um, that was happening in the background in about 2010. And um, along with another project, uh, a project called Active Ingredient. And, Again, I don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna just touch on it briefly, but Active Ingredient was a television show proposal that Jen, um, she came to Montana enough and saw that every meal we did, 90% of them were over a campfire. And people kept coming up and being like, whoa, what's going on over here, what are you doing? And I was so eager to connect with people because that's what I like to do. I'd be like, oh, it's rainbow trout and we're doing it on basalt, volcanic rock and rose hip glaze, and um, she's like, Ed, you gotta do something about this. People are really interested in this, and I didn't wanna do it. Again, I was, I was stereotypically scared about I and ego, and I was like, I can't be in front of the camera. And then I realized that was selfish of me. And I realized that void of needing to do more, that was my in. I could share a message that was so dear to my heart, and television and media could be that outlet. And it took two years for them to convince me to even consider active ingredient. And then like Eduardo does, when I, came, when I said yes, I was all in. And so I left that dream job to go after something that I thought was gonna be bigger and better than I'll ever be by myself. And that's the we, was sharing with we. And so with Montana Max, we're a food company that is really dead set on creating good for you, great for you foods that have no hidden anythings in them. And I don't really care what the FDA has printed. We're looking at that, realizing there's a lot of loopholes and really keeping it legit. Like this is food and I'm a chef and I won't put anything else out there that I wouldn't want to eat. And I do, I've seen my product and been like, oh man, you know, that's not good. I've had, I've had owners in the other room go, what the hell is this today? And I know when my food's not good and there's no worse feeling than having someone tell you that was a bad meal. And so with Montana Max, we're about honest food that is just fantastic and a lifestyle brand. It's about the people behind it. So this is that first summer. We were full of hope. Um, we were full of these dreams, but like um, the Buried Life guys, they were projects. So they were our dreams that we turned into projects through action, through the elimination of fear of failure. And um, with Active Ingredient, um, 
this TV show concept. We filmed a sizzle, and that video you guys watched earlier, some of the beginnings of that is that sizzle, the beginnings, the first sizzle we made. And um, William Morris Agency, through events as they happen, ended up seeing the, the reel and signing me in May of 2011. And then uh, in Montana Mex at the same time, they're like, wow, you already have your own food company? That's amazing. OK, great. And so, so much was happening. It was like this. It was like, God, it wasn't just the horseshoe you were pounding that was red hot. Like, the freaking anvil was smoking hot. Like, everything was going. And um, and hunting season comes around. And I am a total avid hunter. And I'm not a trophy hunter. I'm a food hunter. And that's a good thing. It's. Um, it means when I'm hunting, I'm thinking about the meal, I'm thinking about the animal, I'm thinking about, like Claire said, the gratitude for that animal giving its life so that I could take it and I could share that to others and, um, and then eventually go back in. And um, that is a salsa container on the tip of that, that, that arrow. It's not a broadhead. And so, so while hunting, the only reason I, I could get out and play, but um, I also had to do marketing while I was at it. So this is a part of a campaign we did um, about our salsa is great for you, good for you, honest, natural, not a broadhead or preservative laden, et cetera. Um, so this was maybe the end of August 2011. I just put that in there because that's Jen. And some of you guys have met Jen, and um, she is a ball buster. <laughs> but she's amazing, and she's my muse. And um, she's my best friend. And uh, God, you know the people important to you are the ones that are not easy on you at all. You know, they're the ones that really say, hey, are you going to be you or are you going to be someone that you're not? Because I don't want to hang around with the person that you're not. And I have had to learn that in our relationship the hard way. Um, but that's why I put that in there. So this is October. 8th, 2011, and um, you know, I don't think many people have seen this photo, a couple friends. I know the guy in the photo has seen it, that's my buddy Sam, crazy as all get out. And this is in Montana on a bow hunting day, and um, this was the last photo that I have of myself as a bilateral two-handed hombre. And I love the photo, not because of that, because that doesn't define me. I love the photo because of the tree and because of the colors. And we were in this wicked drainage that right behind us just drops 60 feet. So we had to kind of like shuffle our way around the side. And we, 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 saw, you know, we knew to shuffle around the side because the game that goes up and down this corridor, they do the same. They look at this cliff, and they're not going down it either. So they go to the right. We're like, OK, we're following them. And we went on this game trail. But that's a beautiful photo for me, and, and it, it is significant. So. I'll put that in there, and then you guys all saw the video, so I don't need to do too much explanation, and I don't have enough time to really. Um, maybe that'll come down the line in my future, I'll be able to tell the full story of October 9th and, and that middle of the day. Um, but I, I, I was hiking, and something did catch my eye. And I'm curious. I, I am so curious. It got me in trouble as a kid. And, but I'm curious for all the right reasons. I am. It's because I got this, this freaking passion for knowing you and for knowing you and for loving and hugging and, and feeling and touching everybody. And, um, and that's curiosity based. And that's that kid that got in trouble. And it took me a long time to realize that through maybe the TV show Active Ingredient and through my company Montana Mex and through being proud of who I am and being honest about who I am, I could, I could be curious. Without getting in trouble, I could, I could really just be me in the room. And, and so when I came up to this little ball of fur that I saw, you know, a lot of people would be like, what? You touched some ball of fur that was dead on the ground? Like, why would you do that? Well, because I'm a forager, and I'm a hunter, and I'm a gatherer, and I'm curious. And you know, a lot of times, the food in our freezer is because I was curious, and I went fishing, and I threw a little hopper under a riverbank and caught a trout. That was dinner. And so when I took my knife out to investigate, power must have, and I didn't film this, and I don't remember, but must have arced from somewhere below that bear, where it was running hot, into my knife, into my left hand, and then 
you know, symphonied within me to exit in nine different places. And I do remember the heat, and I do remember the vibration of, like, orchestration within my head. And that was my last memory before, you know, doing what we do every morning, which is open our eyes. And my eyes opened up, and I saw treetops like this, you know. It doesn't look like a treetop, does it? These kind of do. Like treetops like this, you know, if you're laying down. And, and the only thought that went through my head, and guys and gals, you know, this is about as honest as it gets, was get to your knees. And that must come from the moment we're hatched within us, within our mom, that stimulus, that essential, essential, essential piece in every race, color, and creed, every person in this world has it. It's that thing that says live and go out and do and be. And, and that, I, I said that in a few words, and that was get to your knees. It was that internal beat that says get out, get up, do it. You know, my twin brother, um, he's got it too. Took him a little while. We were preemies, you know, a month and a half premature, three and a half pounds, like little chickens. Um, you know, we'd thrown into incubators. He wasn't breathing when he was born. Didn't bother him much, but he just wasn't. So my grandpa, like, smacked him on the ass and <clears throat> got him going. And um, gosh, there's so much to talk to you guys about. But there's so many of these little things that the Do Lectures has inspired me to start thinking about myself. Like, why am I me? Why do I do this? Why do I have that fight to live and, and, and that zest to, to become? And it must have started there. I know it started in all of us when we were born, but I was premature. So maybe that, and this is just conjecture, maybe that's how it started a little bit, is that I was premature and I was thrown in an incubator, so I had to fight to make it past three and a half pounds. And Anyway, after that thought, I, um, there must have been, and I've tried to piece this together, but again, I don't know what happened, but there, there was probably a gap of time from when I, and I, I know I did it, when I said get to your knees, that, um, that passed, because the next memory I have, I was not where I had fallen down or, or got to my knees. I was somewhere else. And it was... The next memory I have is the sound of, of, we've all done it, we've done it out here, and you guys can close your eyes and you can hear it, but it's the sound of gravel underneath your feet, you know, that, and it feels so good, it's such a cool feeling, gravel under your feet, and I grew up on dirt roads, so oh, that's a part of me. And so I feel that, and then my eyes open, and I see this valley in front of me, just doing this, it's just like breathing in front of me, wow. And then a, a bird called the Western Meadowlark, it's a Montana State bird, and it makes this little whistle. And I'll try to do it without blowing everyone's ears off, but it <laughs> went in front of me. And that's about all it took to bring me center and bring me present. I was like, whoa, that was a meadowlark. And I'm walking. And this is, the, uh, this is the valley in front of me. I get it. Why am I here? And then I started to take note, and I started to look, investigate. And my left hand was curled up against my body like this, and it looked like, um, it kind of, I mean, it looked like my left hand, but it was black, and it was fleshed, and it was gripped like this, and it was not looking good. So I was like, check. And <laughs> got it. And then right here, I've got a divot right here, and that's where I, I had a little black spot in my, my pants. So check. And then I had another black spot right here. Check. Okay, and I'd bear spray here, and I'm doing this. I'm thinking, huh, weird. I got holes in me, my hand looks weird, and I got bear spray in my right hand. And I put it back, I was like, okay. I started putting this back, okay. I, I parked, I went hiking, I saw this. Oh yeah, I took, I took my knife. There was a symphony. I was electrocuted. Fuck, I was electrocuted, you know? 
okay, I'm walking. Why am I walking? I'm walking to save my life. Shit, I'm walking to save my life. Okay, and I'm trying to think like a Boy Scout now, and I'm trying to like, okay, so I had these elk calls on lanyards, and I make a quick sling, and I just start chanting. And we've all done this, I think, and sometimes it's while making love. I love you, you're so beautiful, and you start chanting things that you really want to like hit home. And, or, you know, when you're cooking a meal for a thousand people, and you're like, I got this, I got this, it's gonna be so good, I got this. And it's this mantra, this thing that, that, that you do to, to believe in yourself, to push you forward, and I said it, I just said it the whole time, don't stop walking, don't stop walking, don't stop walking. And three miles later, I made it to a cabin, and I got help, and I apologized for the, the flesh that was falling in this guy's driveway, and they called the local EMT department, and I'm just, I'm gonna move quickly here, but I got med jetted down to the Salt Lake burn trauma unit, and through random events, which I, I, I won't share because, but my sister was on that flight with me. She was having to go through town and turn her phone on and get a message that her brother was going to the hospital. And um, so she was on that jet with me. And when I landed and they rolled me off the tarmac, welcome to Salt Lake City, Eduardo. You probably didn't say it like that, actually. That was like a game show voice. And um, <laughs> I'm like looking up from this gurney. It's like, Salt Lake? How am I getting home tonight? And the guy looked at me, he's like, you're not going home for a little while, buddy. And I literally, I've broken my wrist three times, I've broken all my toes, I've got scars galore. And I just thought, a little gauze and some stitches. You know? No, that was not the case. <laughs> so, you may not tell because I've got fantastic Mexican Jewish roots, and my hair came back, thankfully. But I had those nine injuries and, and, and those, those, those exit wounds, and this was one of them. And this is just a shot that shows me in ICU. I'm not sure what's happening. I just, Jen, you're a crazy woman, and she filmed all of this. She flew in from the UK, and she got a call while dancing. She's crazy. She was dancing, and my sister called her, and I don't know, Jen will have to correct me later on, but I don't remember exactly how it went down because I was here, but um, she got the call and typical Jen thought she was in trouble. She fucked up something she did with business and um, she immediately got on the phone. Something's happened to Ed. She knew I was going into a surgery. She got on a flight within five hours and while flying into Chicago, I would have been coming out of my first surgery. and. Jen held it together pretty good, how, is how I've heard the story, until the, like, the landing. And she started to cry. And because she didn't know if she was going to just land to you know, turn your phone on and get that phone call of, hey, Eduardo's passed away, or Eduardo's still with us. And the lady next to her, when she was crying, just kind of like reaches over and says, okay, honey, it's only flying. <laughs> but Jen showed up, and Jen just snapped and rolled photos through this whole event. And I'm glad she did. So this is, this is the last photo I have of my hand before it was cut off. And um, God, it's just so real, you know? And I'm totally okay sharing this and seeing it and because I've accepted me and like we all should. It's just, that's it. You know, that's, that, that is my hand and it, it's done, it's toast. Um, I tried, well, I tried, yeah, I did try. I, I tried everything I knew how to do to will my body into, into healing that hand, and the infection was taken over, and the room smelled of death. And after the fifth day, fifth day of ICU, uh, I mean, they kind of gave me a choice. They didn't give me a choice. The doctor was like, you're going to die, or we're going to take your hand off, because that infection's going straight in. Right now, let's do it. Right now, where's my 10-inch chef's knife? I was ready. He's like, no, 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 buddy. Tomorrow we'll do it. Tomorrow we'll do it. Right now. Well, tomorrow. And so this, we, we took photos. And this is me just soaking it in. Like, okay. This is happening. This is quite a poignant shot. The um, 8 by 11 piece of paper taped to the wall it says, PT has epidural. And if anyone that thought epidurals are just for ladies giving birth, you're wrong. Epidurals are for intense location 
pain for, for locating areas and, and numbing them so you don't feel pain. And when I had four ribs removed from right here because they were charcoal briquettes, I, I don't have them back yet either. Um, so don't punch me or elbow me, good game. Um, <laughs> This is me coming out of that surgery, and um, I just love that shot. And I didn't take it, and I'm just settling. You're gonna be here a while. <laughs> um, I put this in because it's kind of humorous, and I knew this was gonna be a heavy talk. And there's been so many freaking laughing and, and joyous moments throughout the last few days that I, I gotta do something funny. And, and Jen calls this my playgirl shot. And I wouldn't buy that magazine anyway, but I wouldn't buy it if this was the photo in there, like I'm giving this like thing, you know? But this is, this is wound care, you know? This is, this is that scalp wound that was on the front, and I had one here too. This is my wrist, which I still have that scar. I mean, this is the whole nine yards, guys, and this is, this is how lives are saved, and, and it happens every day, it happens every minute. And, um, Look how clear my eyes are. It's like incredible. You'd think they'd be shot. And then it's, of course, the posture. So that's the Playgirl photo. And then this is, this is pain. And we've all felt pain. And I'm here, and I'm smiling, and I'm so stoked on life. And it's just living proof. And we all know it because we've all felt pain. But you can make it through pain. You just have to go within and say, I got this. I can do this, and I can do this. And that's pain. And it's good to be reminded of pain, because none of us want to feel it. So we shouldn't inflict it on others, and we shouldn't bypass it when it's upon ourselves. We should take it in and process it if we can, and be as strong as we can. And like tea, you don't know how strong you are until you boil, pour boiling water on it, and gosh darn it, Everything in my life must have geared me up for these moments. First day I walked, pretty happy. Really happy. That's Sarah from PT. Just, that's, that's accomplishment. That's thin. <laughs> it's 120 pounds. I haven't weighed that since I was like, I don't even know, 112 years old or something. Happiness. Happiness to be alive. This is reflection. A lot of the nurses and the, the, the I'm going over my minutes, I don't know. A lot of the nurses, and, and I'm thankful to them for saying it, but they would say, you gotta process it. Like, I had such a positive attitude, and I was so okay with it, because it was the now, and it was happening, and there was no getting rid of it, and there was no changing any of it. So you have to be okay with it. You gotta just be here, you gotta be present. And, this is one of those shots that shows that I took time. I did take time to think about what was going on. I was thinking about if we should close our company. We didn't. Jen finished our business plan in a recliner that she slept in for 48 days. Um, it was about giving up. Never an option. Ever an option. And this is me just saying, OK, coming to terms with the fact that I'm an amputee, which is not a big deal. It's not. You know, It's just a part of who we are. And this is my first day out of ICU when I got to go stay in a friend's home in Salt Lake City. And my family was there, and Jen was there. And there was this hill that I looked at through my window for 48 days. And I'm a mountain boy by heart. And I look at hills, and that's freedom. And that's, that's where I belong most of the time. And I said, guys, and it was getting late. And this was the night before Thanksgiving. I said, I want to walk to that hill. And I had vacuums and tubes and slippers. I don't wear slippers ever. And I had slippers on and pajamas. I don't wear pajamas ever. And here I go and um, made it to the top of the hill. And Salt Lake uh, City was below us. And the sunset was going. And this was taken with a, with a, with a long lens from afar because I was sitting by myself while my sis, little sister was here and everyone was around me. And I just remember, um, God, it's good to cry, and it's really good to cry because emotions need to leave us so we can make room for new emotions. And that's what this photo was. <laughs> and then this is me looking weird. This is one of that rear scalp wound that through nine, 10 months of scalp expansions, 
they were able to reconstruct my whole head. And, but the reason I put it in here is because I don't have any hair. And I just, unless I'm going over, you can stop me at any time, guys. But while I was in ICU, the doctor walked in one day, and Jen and I were sitting next to each other. And he's like, Eduardo, hey, I want to tell you something. We got to share some stuff. And I'll just cut to the chase. He pretty much rolled a monitor up to me with a shot of my torso, an x-ray shot. And he's like, you have testicular cancer. Okay. And? It's like, well, um, thankfully, it's in its early stage. And I, won't, I don't want to share the details because they're not really relevant. But I went home, and I went through chemotherapy. And God damn it, it was such a pain in the butt because it slowed me down. And, and I had to wait to get my head fixed for another 10 months because I had, I had to stop all my surgeries to do chemo because if they didn't do chemo immediately, they were scared that cancer would develop further in my body. So we stopped everything. We sewed me up. We went home to Montana and I did rigorous, rigorous chemotherapy five days a week for three months. It's the sickest I've ever felt in my life. And my hair fell out. I was determined it wouldn't, but it did. And, um, and then in March, eight, March 18th, I stopped my last round, and in May, I was told that I was cancer-free, May of 2012, and um, I was good to go. Back into all my surgeries. Head fixing was one of them. So this was, this was in May. It took until October, and that got way bigger. I had like a bump out here and a bump out here, and what they were doing is they were stretching my skin so that they could remove these baggies, there was one here and one here, and these are two filling ports, and they would inject saline and stretch my scalp out once a week. I drove to Salt Lake once a week. I would drive for seven hours, get injected for 20 minutes, and drive seven hours home. Um, and when there was enough elasticity, they pulled the baggies and closed me up. And that's why I have a full head of hair. So when you think of silicone implants and when you think of plastic surgery, it can also be that, not what we typically think about. This is me getting back after it um, in, in June, going to look for antlers with my dogs. I had just had a revision on my forearm. I was told not to hike. I did my best to follow the orders. But like I said, I'm a little bit of a rebel. And you know, I would, she said, wait seven days. I would go at six and a half. And I just like this shot, because this is, this is just getting back to life. And then this is one of the parting shots I want to leave you guys with is, um, this is a tree. And this is Emigrant Peak in the background on the Yellowstone River in Paradise Valley, Montana, southwest Montana. And we've heard so much over the last few days. And we all got to go home and digest, not just the amazing food, but everything we've heard. And if you digest anything from me, one of the things I want it to be is that, like, everyone, like the guy said, if you have a vision or a dream, Good for you, and that's great. And I don't mean to belittle it, like literally good for you, because a lot of people don't have dreams and vision. But then you gotta do the next step, and you gotta put it into a project, and you gotta get it in action. And I had this little, I have this little cabin, it's 11 by 18 feet, it's tiny, it's like the size of the stage, it's smaller than the stage. And there was a ladder, and I got rid of the ladder, and I had a dream of a spiral staircase. And I, I went walking on the river one day to look for that spiral staircase. And I saw this tree, it's a juniper, and it must have washed down from upstream because they don't grow this big where I'm from. And it's about 600 years old and it weighed like 700 pounds. And being the optimist, I thought, yeah, chainsaw, me, one buddy, we got this. And it took three chainsaw gas tanks and it took four of us to get this home. This was a mile downstream, the frozen Yellowstone in January. But this is what it looked like taking it off. We put it on a sled, my brother-in-law, Bo, my good friend, Daniel and Sam. And we towed this thing on the river on the ice back up to the truck. And my buddies, they always say, God, you're crazy. Ed. You're doing so much stuff. Like, you know, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? Well, I'm going to do it because I'm going to try. And if I fail trying, that's OK. But I want to try. And I told everyone it was possible to get this tree. And gosh dang it, guys, it is possible. Whether it's a tree, whether it's you want kids, whether you want a beautiful marriage, whether you want to be the president, whether you want to save the world with great beef, whether you, it doesn't matter. Just do it and try and try and fail trying and learn something. We saw that on the wall. If you fail, great, but learn from it. And then it's not wasted time. 
And so that's my staircase at home. And it's a labor of love. And it's just this living image in our cabin of what happens when you try. Beautiful. I love walking up that thing. Our home reeked of cedar and juniper for months. And it creaked for more months than months, like six months while it dried out. And my little sister is scared to death to walk up and down. <laughs> I love it. And this is the last shot. A friend asked me um, a while back after my injury, and he said, hey, Ed, I want you to define um, winning. What does winning mean to you? And I sent him this photo, because this is the first time I went hunting after my injury. And I harvested a cow elk, probably, I don't know, not far, two miles from the closest truck access. And I was with a friend that had to boogie. So he boogied. And I said, no problem. I'll butcher it. And why don't you get another buddy, bring the truck as close as you can, and we'll drag this thing out. And then when he left, I'm sitting there. And I'm doing what I do whenever I take life from an animal. So I'm thanking it. I'm dreaming about the meals I'm going to make. And I'm really taking a moment to soak in the fact that I just took a life and that it's OK. And you have to take time to do something heavy like that. And, um, and then I was just sitting there after I'd done my due diligence. I was just sitting on a hill. And it was great, but it was like getting late and it's cold. And I was like, what am I doing? I should just start dragging this thing out. So I did. I just started dragging this thing out. And I hit this one flat spot. So I won't lie, it was relatively easy. You just had to buckle in. And it was kind of a slope. But then I hit this flat spot. And gosh, that was hard. And you could see where the snow stops and it's dry. And I was also dragging it backwards, because fur goes back from the head back. And I'm dragging it by its rear leg. So I was pulling against the grain, which is God, so like me. <laughs> you know, I should have been dragging the other way around. It would have slid. And when I hit that dirt, I couldn't move it. I had to stop. I had to rest my legs. And I had to lean over like further than like that and really dig in like two feet at a time. And again, I said, this is one of those moments where I'm up on a wall. I'm going to take a photo. So I piled up. This is BLM land, so there was cow poo everywhere. And I piled up a mini cow poo tripod. <laughs> and, and I took this photo. And I sent this to my buddy. And so I just want to leave everyone with that note that, you know what? Winning is something we're all capable of doing. And we're all, we're all required to do, aren't we? Aren't we required to win? It's like, that's why we're here. We're not here to sit around. We're not here to just be kind of like take up space. We're here to win. We're here to make this a better place for all of us. And we're here to share everything about us with this place. It's about this. And it's about this. And it's about that. And it's about winning, which comes down to trying. And trying as hard as you've ever tried before for everything. And you see how it turns out. So thank you. <laughs>